on how social protection strategies and programs uh, are to be coordinated with those of other sectors, including employment and uh, food security. The session will also discuss how integrated social protection information systems can be developed here in Nepal. And uh, the speakers here for this session, I would like to invite uh, Mrs. Sri Krishna Nepal, Joint Secretary, Ministry of Finance Nepal, to chair this session. Let's give a very big round of applause and welcome him. To talk about him, uh, he is the Secretary and Chief of the International Economic Cooperation Coordination Division at the Ministry of Finance. He was with the Economic Policy Analysis Division of the MOF uh, before being transferred to the IECCD. And um, Mr. Nepal has earlier also served as the Deputy Director General at the Department of Customs. Now, next speaker for this session, I would like to invite Mr. Yadu uh, Acharya, Program Director of National Planning Commission Nepal. Let's give it up for him and invite to kindly join here uh, as one of the panelists for this uh, discussion session. Next, I would like to invite Dr. Francesca Gassman. Uh, Francesca Gassman, uh, she is Professor of Social Protection Development at UNU Merit and its School of Governance, where she leads the research theme on social protection, inclusive innovation and development, and teaches in the Institute's graduate programs in the field of social protection and welfare state economics poverty and public policy analysis. Uh, she also has an affirmation at the Boon Rain Singh University of Applied Science as Professor of Poverty and Social Protection. Uh, she has more than 20 years of experience as a consultant and advisor to governments and in international organizations on poverty and social protection policies in Central and Eastern Europe uh, and many other countries, uh, to be very precise. Uh, in the European Commission, ILO, UNICEF, UNDP, the World Bank, OECD, ADB, and um, other numerous countries in Europe as well, she's uh, given her a side of contribution. So let's give it up for Dr. Francesca for being one of the panelists here for this session. Next, I would like to invite Dr. Pinaki Chakraborty here as one of the panelists. Let's give a very big round of applause and welcome Mr. Chakraborty as he is currently Chief Social Policy, uh, Chennai UNICEF. Uh, he has around 20 years of experience in the research uh, of areas of fiscal federalism, tax policy and resource mobilization, applied macroeconomics, public expenditure, uh, management, uh, decentralization, gender and fiscal policy and human development financing. Until most recently, Dr. Chakraborty served as a professor at National Institute of Public Finance and Policy in New Delhi as well. Uh, he has also served as the chairman uh, in Kerala Public Expenditure uh, Review Committee, a stature body appointed by the government of Kerala. And yes, he has uh, served in many organizations, has um, worn hats of uh, various uh, responsibility as well. And thank you so much, Mr. Sakraborty, for being a part of this particular session. Moving on to inviting our next uh, speaker, I would like to call upon Dr. Said uh, Mirza Palevi. Uh, let's join our hands and welcome him on the uh, board of, as a panelist for this particular session. He joined the Ministry of Social Affairs in January 2017 as the head of Center for Social Welfare Data and Information and is responsible for developing and maintaining Indonesia's unified database, including the database for social assistant program as well. Before joining the MOSA, he worked as Statistics Indonesia, where he led the development of several statistical databases and information system. Prior to that, he was a senior research scientist at the National Institute of Advanced Industrial Science and Technology in Japan, conducting research on web databases and machine learning field. One more time, a round of applause to the entire panelist here and would also like to mention that we also have translators 
um, interpreters here. So if you want to use the microphones uh, to know more about the, to have a better communication of the um, session, then you may please uh, utilize it at utmost. With that said, I would like to request the chair to kindly move forward with the session. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Honorable member of National Planning Commission, my colleagues from Ministry of Labor and Social Protection, uh, distinguished presenters, uh, and the participants uh, and the friends from the media, ladies and gentlemen. So we have come to the very important uh, policy dialogue segment of this uh, conference. So the, the system, designing the system, integrating it, and also developing some sort of integrated IT solutions and ultimate, and finally to find some sustainable way of financing to the social protection. Uh, these are very important steps initial actions to be taken to have a resilient, sustainable social protection schemes to be in place, to be, in, to be operational. And that would be very much useful and instrumental to reach out to the targeted segment and also to make those social protection schemes uh, universal and inclusive sustainable. So that's why it's, it's very much related to the Agenda 2030 and also to develop an inclusive society and ultimately providing the economic and social safety net to the people at large. So this is why the system development is very important. Uh, we would have uh, four important presentations uh, uh, this afternoon by the distinguished panelists is uh, rightly introduced uh, by the, our master of ceremony. And uh, today, the presentation, uh, the presenters will highlight on the systematic approach, what sort of systems to be designed, what sort of policies to be in place, how the peoples are insured to be protected, to be covered by those, uh, and also they can cover organize the poverty and the risk throughout their life cycle. And how can we integrate the different scheme, the fragmented schemes which have been initiated with a list coverage, with a very low level of reach out to the target communities, target people, and what would be the way of formulating such policies, such, such systems also will be highlighted. And how can we coordinate the strategic social protection schemes, policies, to the some of the individual initiatives, and also the sectoral alignment and our harmonizations, coordinations like to the other sector, employment, food security, health, and something, some, some other, other, other sectors which is related to the, broadly to the social protection. And how can we develop a robust system which will rightly integrate through that system the, all, the, all, the, all the fragmented schemes so that the, we can better focus to the, to the coverage, to the quality, to the, to the target group, and also we can have a database real-time reportings, the status, uh, so that uh, the, 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 the utilizations of the resources, uh, substantial interventions to the, to the targeted communities will be, will be ensured. And also finally coming up to the financing options, like what would be the options as, as it, it is considered as, as a state's obligations, the social protection um, to be funded by the, by the state. Anyway, the state should manage it. So the, what are the options available to us? What are the fiscal space and the options to, to finance and to, to sustain it for a longer time? Because we will be envisioning the social security schemes to be operationalized, to be implemented for a longer time. 
So these issues will be rightly covered and touched during the um, presentation uh, by the by the distinguished panelists. So I would not uh, take much much more of the time, and then I would like to move on to the uh, uh, presentation. So first, I would like to request Mr. Yadu Acharya, Program Director, National Planning Commission, Government of Nepal, uh, for his for his presentation. Uh, please. Uh, thank you, uh, respected chair, honorable member, National Planning Commission, uh, respected secretaries and joint secretaries, and all distinguished participants. Um, I would like to present in brief the uh, social protection policy integration system implementation mechanism and sustainable financing in Nepal. Uh, my presentation is, uh, I think, it is the long and. Uh, I will try to finish it on time. Uh, I think you have provided me only 15 minutes. <laughs> Sorry. The basic outlines are the social protection policy in Nepal, social protection schemes, policy issues, policy integration, implementation mechanism, and sustainable financing. In this session, uh, we will discuss Uh, the existing legal provisions um, in Nepal, uh, the, the social protection schemes are regulated by various acts, regulations, and directives. No single umbrella act and regulations is uh, prevailing here. The Constitution of Nepal has guided the social protection and social security schemes. Uh, this, uh, the Constitution's Article 43 as a provision of social protection. And so on the Social Security Act 2075, it means 2018, uh, the recently enacted. And uh, so on, uh, Contribution Based Social Security Act 2074 is also in existence. The Act Relating to Rights of Persons with Disabilities, 2074. The Public Health Service Act, Social Security Fund Management and Operation Regulation, Prime Minister Employment Program Guidelines and Social Security Plan Operation Guidelines and other thematic acts, regulations and guidelines are here. So it means various acts and regulation guidelines are the regulating uh, social protect protection uh, schemes. Uh, so on plans and policies, also with us, the uh, plans, periodic plan, uh, basically uh, from ninth plan, the social security and social protection schemes are regulated. They are uh, incorporated in the plan. Uh, now we are uh, in the execution phase of 15th plan, uh, 15th period plan. This is the five-year plan, and it has also uh, uh, elaborated various strategies, objectives, and uh, working uh, objectives also uh, in the plan. So provincial and local governments periodic plans also uh, regulate the social protection schemes, government of Nepal policies and programs. It means uh, annual po program and policies uh, before the annual budget. Uh, so on provincial government's policies and programs, uh, annual plans itself also uh, guide uh, the uh, social security schemes in Nepal. And annual plans of provincial and local governments also regulate the uh, social security schemes. And other thematic plans and policies just like health plants uh, and agricultural plants also. So many thematic plants are there and uh, some master plants of local levels and provincial level also regulate the uh, social protection schemes. And so on we have thematic policies also for the social protection and uh, social security schemes. For instance, health policy, education policy, agricultural policy, employment, insurance, disaster response, supply policy and settlement. Financial and fiscal policy itself also guide the, are also guiding the social security schemes. So various plans and policies, various acts are prevailing uh, for the regulation of social security in uh, Nepal. We need the integration of such policies and plans. And major schemes, there are more than 80 schemes that are existing in uh, uh, our country. 
major schemes are social assistance, social insurance, and so on, uh, public work, social care and assistance, labor market intervention, and other types of social uh, security schemes are with us. Among them, social assistance covered most of these schemes. Among the social assistance, cash transfer is the major uh, method or modality of our uh, social assistance. Um, just like senior citizen allowances, single women allowances, allowance for the disabled persons, child protection grants, allowance for the man marginalized ethnicity, maternal incentive scheme, health treatment fund for senior citizens, health treatment fund for poor deprived citizens, disaster relief fund, national fund for reconstruction, a tax exemption and debt relief and basics and secondary education scholarship, and meals, etc. Uh, besides these, all other schemes also with us. Uh, so on in, can, in kind transfer, not cash, some major schemes are public food distribution system from the uh, Ministry of Agriculture and, uh, sorry, Ministry of uh, Commerce Supply, uh, Industry Commerce and Supply. So an itemized salt distribution, integrated child health and nutrition program, free distribution of basic medicines and others, so many uh, with us. So on second category of social protection scheme is the social insurance. Under this, we have the employment provident fund, retirement fund, work injury insurance, health insurance, crop and livestock insurance also, and social security fund, contribution-based social security fund also with us. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Third category is the social care and services. In this sector, senior citizen care centers are running in various areas of the country. And child care centers, traffic to bend relief and rehabilitation centers, leprosy care and rehabilitation centers, and rehabilitation center for the disabled also. So on in labor market interventions, we have this scheme of contribution-based social security scheme for the laborers, technical and vocational education and trainings, youth self-employment fund, technical and vocational education and trainings for the poor and deprived youths. Among public works, rural community trans infrastructure program, prime minister employment program, and Torai Modis Samriti program are the major, and besides these, other schemes also with us. Besides these, the other schemes, the sixth categories, uh, some important schemes are listed here. The people's residence program, subsidized housing. We call it the Janta Abbas Karigam. So Mukta Komeya Rehabilitation Program we, was with us. It is, uh, I think it, is, uh, it has terminated. Badi Rehabilitation Program, microfinance support programs, microinsurance support programs, and free treatment for the target groups and others. Some policy issues are with us. The National Planning Commission, Commission is one of the uh, major policy um, related institution. So we, have, we are working uh, under the National Planning Commission, the social protection policy issues also. The social security protect, uh, or uh, protection policy issues, the first uh, column is, is issue and second, the possible intervention is uh, here. Um, I would like to request you all uh, for the uh, for your valuable input in the possible intervention area also. The major issue here is the uh, here listed are only 10, 11, and uh, maybe more than that. Social security needs out of safety net population, one of the ma major uh, issue. Who are, uh, how many people or populations are uh, under the coverage of social security? And this needs to be uh, assessed. So the need assessment of the entire human life, adult needs assessment after shocks should be uh, done, we think. So on sustainability, for the sustainability of the uh, social protection schemes, the contribution-based schemes should be uh, launched. 
and the possible intervention area. And the regulated by varied, you know, our other issue is regulated by the varied thematic laws and regulations. No single umbrella act is there. So a representative legal framework should be uh, maintained. And varied thematic manuals, guidelines also guide the or regulating the um, issue. So an integrated manual or guideline for all schemes should be there. And some schemes are only based on annual budgets. In our annual budget, only the uh, schemes uh, that is to be addressed are uh, incorporated annually. Uh, so for the intervention, for this uh, type of intervention, we need the, the policy and the guidelines for the regulation. On a specified uh, designated responsibility of the tribes of the government, we have three types of government, federal, uh, provincial, and local. The what uh, level of government should, uh, what type of social security scheme uh, is not designated, so that we need the uh, designated social security uh, system and policy harmonization among the three types of government is urgent in this time also. And so on the coordination issue is there. Role of private sector, CBOs and the NGOs also should be specified and horizontal and vertical coordination is must. And uh, another issue is updated data on social security system. We have uh, lacking the updated data system, a database, a reliable database on social security and social protection schemes. So we need efficient management information system for the <coughs> data management also, and multiple scheme beneficiaries. It means one person is taking more than one, more than two or three or four type of social security benefits, so how can they be uh, treated? For, for this also, a regular updated database is needed, and varied schemes regulated by various agencies and legal provisions. For, to respond to this, we need an integrated framework for social protection. So we are working under this, an integrated framework uh, is uh, going to prepare under uh, the aegis of National Planning Commission. Sorry. And next, social protection policy integration. For this requirement, a leading policy framework addressing all schemes we are exercising in this uh, regards. The types of schemes should as, uh, we should address. Base of schemes, what is the base? Right base, need base, or contribution based? We should specify that. And a beneficiary unit, what is the beneficiary unit? Individual or household? For whom we should treat it. And addressing time immediately or within a fixed time interval, that is should be specified. And availability, compulsory or voluntary? Our law has managed the voluntary, voluntary uh, reject, rejection of the uh, social security schemes also. So the compulsory or voluntary should be also specified. Mode of payment, cash kind or services, what type of modality should be adopted? And the modality of cash reimbursement, cash to hands or banking channel should be specified and financing resources also and implementation modality. Also implementation agency units and monitoring. Integrated social protection framework on progress. We are exercising uh, such type of uh, framework to be prepared. Here the um, Six types of social protection okay. uh, schemes are listed in the first column, and other uh, columns are provisions, responsible agency for financing, and responsible agency for implementation based on right based, need based, or contribution based, type of response, beneficiary units, type of payment, mode of payment, and annual estimated beneficiaries and annual estimated budget also. Some issues uh, regarding the implementation are uh, identifying and informing the beneficiaries, who are the beneficiaries should be identified, and database management, networking and updating also the issues, and designing implementation agencies, uh, designating, in, 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 yeah, sorry, implementing agencies, responsibility of the multiple tier of government. Multi-scheme beneficiaries should be addressed, assurance of quality of services and income transfer, and monitoring system also. And this is the implementation mechanism. Uh, 
I would like to skip this. Uh, this is the very most complex in the sense. Um, in this uh, table, uh, we have managed that the five implementing, uh, implementing some uh, states and the responsible agencies also. And last, the financing. Uh, currently, we have more than 80 schemes that are to be addressed by the uh, National Treasury. Around 10 to 12 percent of the annual budget is allocated to the uh, social security schemes, 11.3 percent in the uh, last year, covering about 70, 17 percent of the total population. Ongoing periodic plans target 13.7 percent of annual budgets and population covers 60 percent. An allocation from annual budget, most of the uh, social security response are from allocated from the annual budget, federal, provincial, and local levels. An allocation to ministerial budget for the designated schemes. And almost of the schemes from government treasury, few schemes are contribution based, negligible from NGO and private sectors. A significant, significant volume of funds transferred to local level in under conditional grants, Sasartan Dan, which said it. Ad hoc release for disaster shock response from MOF. This is the financing modality. Uh, the source of funds, release of fund in kind of fund or in kind transfer and mode of payment and monitoring are the four uh, major area of the area to respond to the financing. Uh, source of funds, basically, this is from government of Nepal. Uh, and uh, other agencies have social care and services. The private sector also contributes some funds. And labor market intervention, the private sector also, uh, they contribute, okay. I will finish only within one minute. Uh, and <coughs> release of the fund, uh, the modality of release to fund is the conditional grant to the local level for the social assistance and the conditional grant to the local level for public works and a grant to care and care services centers and the contribution of laborers and employers are the SP of social protection funds funds. Uh, I would like to skip for uh, other areas. And one little issues for financing the last slide I think in this is the approach is contribution based. We recommend the contribution based financing is the sustainable one. A regular source of funds, public, private sector, NGOs public-private partnership, beneficiary contribution, the sector should be managed there, and a resource release transfer modality in federal structure, what type of modality should be adopted, uh, is one issue, and a payment modality also, and another issue. Uh, the accounting system, monitoring and auditing system, and the evaluation and review system also uh, should be there. Uh, thank you. So, thank you very much for your informative presentation. So may I now request uh, Mr. Dr. Francisca Kaiserman, Professor of Social Protection and Development, Massachusetts University. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure and an honor to be here. And I would like to thank UNICEF and also GIZ for bringing me here and for you having me. Now, listening to the previous uh, presentation, I can see policy consolidation is an important issue within social protection. However, I will go beyond social protection in my presentation and hopefully I'm able to show you how important complementary policies are in order to strengthen the impact and the effect of social protection. Now, Social protection, I hopefully by the end of these two days, we can all agree it is indeed an investment in people, in communities, and in a country at large. This, which looks like a very complex, complicated system in a way, is just a circle from starting with social protection interventions, household utilizing the money, spending the money, increasing human capital, investing in livelihood saving, maybe even join the labor market, which will eventually also lead to economic growth, socioeconomic development, and poverty reduction. 
Now, what we have been trying to do over the last couple of years, and mainly together with UNICEF in a number of countries, is to ask, can we now estimate the rates of return of investing in social protection? You know, you can invest in a bridge, and it is relatively straightforward to calculate what the returns of such an investment will be. But with social protection, it's much that's, let's say, a little bit more challenging because the returns or the effects acquiring in the long term, a lot of them and are indirect. It's very difficult to assign a number to it. However, we have tried to do that through micro simulation for a couple of countries, very basic, and I'm showing here just three examples. We started in Cambodia, we did it in Lesotho, and the final example is also from Uganda. So they are different social protection packages, really non-contributory packages. Usually in some cases we compare a child grant versus an elderly pension. In some countries, like in Cambodia, it would have been the full package which would cover over everybody over the whole life cycle. And comparing the costs with the returns over time. And the returns here, due to data limitations, are mainly that the transfer is invested in human capital development. Let's say children will go to school, they will stay in school longer, and as a result of more education, they will also have a higher income in the future, which we generally call the returns to education. Now, this turns into kind of a virtual circle over time, and as such will lead to positive returns here in our models measured at the household level, but will also be beneficial for the economy in the longer term. What you also see from these pictures, and it takes a long time for these returns to become positive, but I also think it is a lower boundary given that we can only take one effect into consideration here in these models. But because it also takes a long time until we see, let's say, positive returns to these investments, it also requires quite some political will and stamina to make these kind of decisions and invest the kind of funding which is needed to do that. But these, in a way, are just averages, simulated averages for a country. Another thing which we need to realize that the circumstances or the context within which a household lives determines to some extent the impact a social protection or cash transfer can have on these households. So here this is from a study we have done in Kenya and we're comparing here two, let's say, um, cash transfer programs, one is the hunger and safety net program and the other is the orphans and vulnerable child grant program. And I have circled a couple of findings and what is really interesting here you see, for example, from your perspective on the top left, it is about, let's say, what is the impact of the cash transfers on the education expenditures in a household per child? And we have looked at, let's say, the returns to education, and we have organized these returns from low returns to high returns. And what you see is that par apparently parents make a rather rational decision as to how much they invest in the education of their children. So if the returns to education, so meaning that there are job opportunities, once children are leaving school, they will find employment, and so on, so they're more likely to invest money into the education. What is also interesting, for example, if you go here to the top uh, uh, right graph, it is, there was a question to what extent is a cash transfer able, let's say, to protect food security in a household? And what you see here is that in, in the Kenyan case, in very drought-stricken um, areas and households which are already have a rather low expenditures on food, there the cash transfer was most effective also in protecting these kinds of households. We have also seen, for example, in the middle, to some extent, it, it matters how far away from a market a household lives. Also, that will influence what households can and will do with the transfer which is assigned to them. 
Now, in line of this research, what we also see, so if you think back of this initial framework, I have shown you it also. So if you look at this, so there is a cash transfer, let's say. This goes into the household, increases the household income. But then the question is, well, again, what can the household do with that? And in our frameworks, we all know, and we have evidence on that, there is food security, health, education, livelihoods, you name it. But in many cases, there are barriers in order to make these kind of investments. And these barriers can be of very different nature, as we also will see later. And eventually, they will affect the productivity. So I've been, when this morning in the session about productivity, I was thinking, yes, maybe my presentation would also have fit in there. But so if we think about the policy response, what can we do? And here you see first, obviously, we already have been talking about cash plus programs in the morning. And the plus is very important to overcome certain barriers, particularly also at the household level. But they're also often on the very left hand side, you see there are design and implementation barriers. So if you have to go whatever to collect your money or you're not informed about that, there can be actually barriers in the design of social protection, which actually prevents the money coming to the households which need them most. And then we have, let's say, household and individual level barriers, for example, lack of knowledge in Kenya. There are a couple of pilot programs and, uh, which would also look at there is a cash program and there would be a top off of the cash program together with some conditionalities so that let's say women would actually go to the hospital to give birth, but that also comes along with some transportation money. Or there would be training sessions whenever the mother goes with the infant for growth monitoring and the like. And that has been proven to be very effective to for overcome some of these barriers. But then there are also environmental barriers, so which really require wider sectoral policies. And for that, I would like to go and show you and again another framework. And if you think again, so first of all, we know there is a lot of evidence of local multiplier effects. Again, the cash enters a household. The recipient will do something with it, would like to do something with it. And here we look predominantly at the productive impacts such a transfer can have. In order to, let's say, to, to use the transfer in what we would call whatever productive way, so first of all, there are some what is also Armando Barrientos would say are growth mediating processes. Maybe you need access to transportation, credit, telecommunication. But also on the other hand, we have the productive activities like wage labor, so they can maybe use in agricultural production, non-farm trade, and so on. Now the money goes into the household, and depending on the capacity, it's also um, what it is used for. So it's also at the local community, the non-beneficiaries are also going to benefit from this transfer. Uh, that is what we call the local multiplier effect. So, and then depending, for example, the household might uh, um, spend the money to buy food or also what we have seen, for example, in Uganda among the, the old age pensioners, let's say the beneficiaries would hire local labor to work the land because they were no longer in a position to do that. So it has actually, let's say, at very remote areas, it had a very positive effect on the local labor market and provided employment opportunities for others. But then it also so the wider community might also benefit from that because sometimes because the need, there is a need for increased need for transportation. Some transportation providers will maybe offer more water, water services to bring people to the market and so on. And if there is more transfer, that will benefit the whole community. However, what we have found out is context really matters. Huh? That, uh, you can see this immediately from this framework. So if you live in a very remote area where you, the, the, the next market is far away, there is no all year weather road, how are you going to bring your goods to the markets? Most probably not. And what we have also noticed is that actually in some cases, if you already have these, let's say, structural inequalities across areas in a country, that can actually also, so a cash transfer in a worst case can increase these local inequalities, yes? 
because let's say the better off, better endowed communities will even increase or um, benefit more from the social protection and those which are less endowed might actually, relatively speaking, fall back even more. Now the key messages uh, of this all is, first of all, that we have to realize that there are certain barriers which really hamper households' investments and as such the long-term impact of our social protection programs. And for to have maximum effect, it is, let's say that is social protection in itself is very important, but it is also very clear that we need complementary policies so that social protection can really uh, uh, generate all the effects and the impacts it has. It requires investments in infrastructure, investments in agriculture, investments in telecommunications. And so if I have, would have time, I could give you plenty of examples for that. So, and then uh, also cash plus, which is just uh, to provide at the household level additional services and support, all in order that households can make the most out of it. So as such, for me, the conclusion is that social protection is an investment in people, but as said, eventually also in the country at large, but it also it is requires, let's say, over time it accumulates really positive returns. It, requires a long-term investment. And as such, it also contributes to inclusive growth because it can help people to participate in economic process and increase their livelihood. So, but as I said, context matters. And that is also where we have to think of in addition to social protection. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Frangishka for your uh, insightful presentation. Uh, let me request Dr. Pinky Chakraborty, Chief of Social Policy, Chennai Office, UNICEF, India, for his presentation. Thank you, Chair, distinguished panelists and participants. I'll focus on some of the issues related to financing of social protection. When you talk about funding social protection, I think yesterday morning, the finance minister of Nepal was highlighting the issue of fiscal space and increasing difficulty related to taxation. Now, if we talk about financing social protection, in an ideal case, it should be financed by domestic revenues. Now, there are certain constraints to revenue mobilization, especially now after we have large-scale issues post-globalization related to taxation. So it's very difficult for a country to have an independent tax policy. If an emerging market economy wants to do a large social protection program and wants to increase tax rate, it has to see what is the tax rates in other countries who are also trying to attracting, attract the same global investments. So independent tax policy is a challenge now. Progressive taxation is not the norm anymore for direct taxes. Tax rates have over the years, in the last 25, 30 years, have become more or less flat. Indirect taxation is mostly in the form of VAT. 130 plus countries have value-added tax, and that is not a progressive tax one, because value-added talks about simplicity of taxation, not about progressivities of taxation. And there is also a strict control on government borrowing because of the Fiscal Responsibility Act in most countries. So there is strict fiscal regulations when it comes to uh, increased domestic revenues. Idea is if you have a flat tax rate, if you have a GST or VAT which is again flat and simply, simple, we should be able to mobilize more and more revenue. But I think there is a limit to that kind of a taxation. And we are talking about a simple taxation for higher growth, but economy has its own cyclical movement. So in times of recession, it becomes even more difficult to mobilize taxes. 
So what are the ways that we could think of financing social protection program, which will increasingly become an issue when it comes to providing resources for it? I think countries can finance SP by imposing sales and surcharges. And I have looked at some of the data which government of India has produced. I think our sales and surcharges contribute a very significant proportion to the extent of you know, 17 to 18% of the gross tax revenue. Domestic resource mobilization is the key. Pruning tax exemption can increase domestic resource mobilization. I think we do not have reliable estimates of tax expenditure. Tax expenditure is significant in many countries and it is non-transparent. I think it is very important that we reduce tax expenditure, which actually can provide a lot of resources for doing social sector financing, be it social, uh, social protection or education or health or any other program that are on the social sector side. So, so I think these are issues that are very important uh, for innovative public finance policy. The role of domestic taxes, increasing domestic taxation to finance social incremental uh, investment in social protection, that space is very limited. If tax is so, so as the story that I am trying to say, as the tax is no longer a redistributive one, can we make expenditure more progressive? Because the fiscal policy has to be progressive and inclusive one for inclusive growth. So, so I think where there is a huge policy research gap in my view, there is a need for evidence generation or, on net fiscal benefit for political accept acceptance of large social transfers program. What do I mean by net fiscal benefit? I think as, as we discussed uh, yesterday, indirect taxes are always regressive, direct taxes have become flat, and indirect taxes are paid by everybody. Now we say that we give social transfers in terms of some resources to the households to, uh, to actually increase their uh, spending abilities or access certain services. I think if we look at the taxes they pay, and the expenditure transfers they receive, that net fiscal benefit evidence we do not have across countries. Even for, um, uh, even a basic understanding of that based on households net fiscal benefit can actually show us what is the net fiscal transfer that is happening to at, uh, happening at the household level. So these are some of the issues that, and that can be a very good policy tool to influence how much it is important to have investment in social protection in, uh, expenditures. Now, effectiveness and macroeconomic cycle. I think if we look at literature, many SPs have pro-cyclical biases. I have looked at some of the big programs. These are introduced in times of economic boom. That means when the government has more revenue, government becomes more redistributive. Since SPs are redistributive in nature, program allocation can be influenced by political cycle. And then it can have an issue of unpredictability and ad hocism. So how do we increase program effectiveness? And if we say that program effectiveness in two different situations, that is in boom and in recession, program effectiveness multiplier is more in times of economic recession. So it has to be insulated from political cycle as well as the economic cycle. And we need to remove the pro-cyclical bias. It's not that we are going to make investment when I have more public revenues, but in time suppression, probably it is more, more, more important and critical. Now, this is something, can we protect a social protection expenditure through rights? I had just looked at India's data we had introduced three right-based entitlement in India. In 2002, we, uh, we had Right to Education Act. Then 2005, we had Right to Employment Act, which provides 100 days of employment to households uh, in rural India. In all the districts, it is, it is implemented now. And then we had Food Security Act, which was done in 2013. Now, if, and I have provided data from 2008-9 to 2018-19, 
So it has data before the rights were introduced and after the right was uh, rights were introduced for these three programs. We don't see any major change in expenditure as a percentage of GDP. It remained more or less, more or less at 1.5% of GDP. That is only spent by the center. I'm not talking about the states. India is a very uh, decentralized uh, fiscally and 60% of the spending is at the state level. So if you take the state expenditure, it will be even higher. But if we see what the central government spends on these rights because these are national acts, uh, the, the, the program expenditure has not really increased over time. The second issue is access. This is the approved labor budget of NREG. I'm just giving it as an example. And if we look at, NREG is based on self-targeting. So, so there is no, it's not a targeted program. So if somebody is interested to work in unskilled manual labor for 100 days can go to the local government and, and get a job. Now, if we look at self-targeting is working. So as, uh, we have scheduled caste, scheduled tribe, and then women, if we take to, uh, all these three categories of workers together, they contribute more than 90% of the total. So that means poor and vulnerable are going and working in NREGA. But average days of employment provided for our per household, as per the act, is 100. But if we look at the last but one row, it's around 50%. So instead of 100 days, only 50 days of employment has been generated. And if we look at the wage, average wage rate per day per person, over the year, in nominal terms, remain more or less fixed. I think this has got to do with the investment, as I had shown before, in terms of as a percentage of GDP. So we are basically trying to squeeze in. We have a right, but we don't increase the you know wage rate and the num percentage. Uh, do those self-targeting and demand-driven, but number of average per, uh, average days of employment provided per household supposed to be 100, but it's much less. And now, if we look at the, the, the special distribution of this job for women, which is um, who, who contribute the uh, largest proportion of the number of days of employment generated, it's highly unequal. The states who are well off, there the state-wise women's participation rate in direct employment transfer is also very high. Kerala, Tamil Nadu, and look at the poorer states like Uttar Pradesh and Bihar who are at the bottom. So, so there is an inequality so, 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 so the richer and prosperous regions are able to benefit uh, more in, 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 in exercising these rights. So, so, so there is an issue. So, so, so accentuation of inequality hasn't reduced in spite of rights. So investment has to be more progressive. It doesn't seem to be the case when you look at NREGA data. Now, Coordination issues then becomes very imp important in a decentralized setting. Central coordination is certainly important, but delivery mechanism can be decentralized. However, design flexibility is critical for better outcome. Avoiding one-size-fits-all policy can really help. It is not only vertical and horizontal coordination, it is also about vertical and horizontal fiscal equality. I think the states who are poor, they are not able to absorb this capacity, uh, absorb this fund because there are a lot of conditionalities attached to it. So those flexibilities can really improve outcomes. So, so by a centrally determined one size fits all protection measures through rights may become unequal if the poorer regions are not equipped enough fiscally to absorb these investment. So that comes out very clearly. Now, in the conclusions, I would say that country context and structure is critical when you are talking about designing policies. Clear expenditure assignment across levels of governments become very, very important. I would highlight a rural employment in India is a state subject, but there is a national act. So that, uh, so, 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 so central coordination then becomes important, but decentralized delivery and monitoring then becomes even more critical. Clear roles and activity mapping of fund function and functionaries and implementation of schemes could help in a decentralized setting. Entitlement-based spending versus scheme based spending should follow principles of subsidiarity. And by, by that, I mean the, st the local governments and the state governments 
in a federal setting should do everything except the one which central government has to do. So, so that, that is very important for the delivery for, and for effective, effective and equal investment. Why not have a social protection scheme statement in the national and state budget? Uh, um, uh, and the, the presentation on Nepal, there was there was those number of schemes that were high, uh, um, uh, that were highlighted in your statement. I think it is very important for countries to have a social protection scheme statement in the national and state budget, which would give us an idea about the public finance of social protection. We really do not have comparable data, or at least data which would tell us what are the schemes, how much money government spends on those schemes. So a social protection statement in national and sub-national budget can help us uh, to get greater fiscal transparency and its outcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Pinky, uh, for your comprehensive uh, presentation from the financing perspective. So now we, ha we have come to the final presentation of this session. Uh, I would like to request Dr. Saeed Mirja Pal Palevi, Head of Data and Information Center, Ministry of Social Affairs, Government of Indonesia, for your presentation, please. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, First, I would like to say thanks to GIZ who invited me here. So I have an opportunity to discuss with you yeah, at the question and answering session later. So um, probably my presentation today is uh, quite different with the previous uh, presenter because I'm going to focus on how managing the data and system in order to coordinating uh, social protection programs managed by uh, various ministry or un, uh, institutional in Indonesia. So, uh, first of all, this is uh, the data of the poor household in Indonesia. As you see the statistic there, there, is, there are 27 million ho poor households in Indonesia. It consists of 29.1 million families in the household. In turn, it consists of uh, 98.1 million individuals. So it's a quite large number. The problem is how can we manage this database? As you can uh, imagine, this database should be periodically updated because this database will be the target for the social protection program. As indicated by the law number 13 of 2011 concerning the handling of the poor of Indonesia, Ministry of Social Affairs, or MOSA, is responsible for managing the UDB. We call this database UDB, Unified Database. And the pro social protection programs carried out by the other institutions should be based on the UDB. So this is kind of institutional arrangement in Indonesia. We, uh, we have one uh, social beneficiary or social protection database, which is used by the all social protection program. So, uh, what is the Indonesia UDB? It is the detailed socio-economic uh, information of the 40% lowest income group. So, socio-economic means that there is information about the health, about the education, about the condition of the house, uh, where the house full household live there, and also including the name and the address of the household. So it will become the targeting for, for the social protection program, most of social protection program in Indonesia. So uh, the most important point is that this database will be used to interlinking the social protection programs so that they are better complementing one another. This, uh, this is this show, show, shown by the next slide here. So uh, you can see on the left hand side is the poor household ranked by their uh, welfare. It means that the poorest one uh, placing into the, low, into, the, into the bottom, up to the, the, uh, the non-poor one. So, for example, conditional cash transfer for family take from the bottom until 18% uh, of the UDB. It consists of 10 million families there. 
and also food assistance program takes from the bottom, from the poorest one, to the 25%. It consists of 15.5 uh, million families there. Both programs managed by the MOSA, Ministry of Social Affairs. On the other hand, the Ministry of Health, uh, with their government paid health insurance programs, also takes from the bottom, until 38%. Of, uh, of the family there. It consists of uh, uh, 96.1 million people. And the Ministry of Energy and Mineral Resource takes the whole of the database, take the whole of the household there in order to give them uh, electricity and LPG subsidies program. So as you can see that several uh, social projects and programs will select the beneficiary only with, uh, only with one database. And the database is what we call the URIWI, which is maintained by the uh, MOSA, Ministry of Social Affairs. Next. Uh, so what's next? We have the database, but the database should be updated periodically. Because when the database is not accurate, so that for the social protection program be necessary. So this is the main issue now. As you can see, there is 27 million household there. Uh, we have around uh, 75 village in Indonesia. So the household scatter around the village. And also we have 17.5 thousand islands. This is quite big, you know. Uh, I heard that there is no island in the Nepal. Yeah? So <laughs> we have 17.5 thousand islands there. So, so the house was scattered around the country. So uh, the point is that it is difficult to update the data, to update the poor household condition. So it needs a lot of budget. For example, in 2015, we have uh, updated the whole database, around 20, uh, 25 million household. It costs uh, around uh, $80 million US, US dollars there. And the next problem is that many villages lack of human resource and skills to update their own data. Currently, according to the law uh, 24, uh, 2013, each local government has to update their own uh, poor household existing in the UDB. So they need to learn how to update. They uh, need to improve the capability of the enumerator in the field in order to update the data. But not all the local government can do it. The last one is that not all local governments support updating data. Indonesia has uh, autonomous local governance. So uh, there is no direct organizational relationship between the central government with the local governments, especially for the MOSA, Ministry of Social Affairs. So we cannot directly instruct them to do that or this. This is quite a uh, challenging uh, pr problem uh, in Indonesia. So what we do? First one is that we already have the UDB. We integrate the UDB, Unified Database, the poor household database there, with the other data residing uh, in the institution or in ministries. It is the social protection beneficiary data. We integrate the data. And then we also integrate the social worker data. It means that the people, the organization that help for uh, success, successfully implementing the social protection program here. So we also have the support data, the budget, the realization transaction, also the image, the photo of the uh, house condition of the poor household, we have that one. Also the geolocation of the poor house, household, where the house of the poor household reside in, in the countries. We also have that kind of data. We integrate this kind of data into one database, what we call integrated social welfare data. So it becomes the lower part here. As you see at the lower part, there is, uh, is illustrate one household there that receive LPG and electricity subsidy because there is flag LPG and sub uh, electricity there. And there is two families in the household the first one uh, uh, received the CCT for family program, food, uh, uh, food assistance, and also for the uh, education subsidy and health insurance, health insurance subsidy. While the second family 
uh, only uh, accept the food and school and health insurance. So we get more rich information in our UDB because we have combined or, or integrated various database and enriching in, in, in the database. So we can answer quite a sophisticated uh, question on the left hand side. Which poor household received the CCT for family and also food assistance program? And who are the social worker facilitator who assist them? And where is their home on the map? Because we also have the geolocation of the house. So uh, by maintaining this integrity data, we can encourage the local governments to, you know, to update the data periodically because we also provide the IT infrastructure and also the connection of the internet and also uh, we build the system so they, they don't no need to uh, allocate budget to build the system, just use ours in order to make them uh, update their own uh, poor household database. So next, after we construct the integrated database on the below part, now we have uh, system inf information system because a large database should uh, should be followed by the good information system. The information, information system we, we call integrated social welfare information system next generation. It's called a 6NG. This information system residing on the top of the database there. It facilitates the local government to update their own household database by online. So they can uh, stream the database of uh, the local uh, residing on the local uh, area in the government by using the Android application. And then they uh, doing some discussion, what we call the village meeting. So the list of the poor household there, uh, they do the discussion between them about the, about the uh, state of the welfare of the poor, the poor household. And then they visit the household to update the data, probably uh, the data of the education, the health, and also the condition of the house of the poor household, and then they send back the data to the MOSA. This should be done based on uh, regulation of Ministry of Social Affairs, uh, number 28, 2017. It's a regulate general guideline for updating the UDB. This updating process at least can be done uh, once a year. But uh, the decree of Minister of Social Affairs is issued every, every three months. After the decree has been issued, so the other social protection programs can use, can use the data from there. And one important point is that the system has already connected to the insurance, health insurance database, and also has been connected to, to the civil recorded registration. So this data and the other uh, important data has been interlinked one with another. Next, this, this example, uh, the data that has been collected by our Android application. As you can see here, the point of interest there in the uh, green uh, one shows the location of the poor household in the area, some area in Jakarta. As you can see, the poor household tends to live along of the river. It is, you know, it is the general characteristic of, of the poor household in, in uh, big cities in Indonesia. And we, when we click one of the point, we can get more detailed information. For example, we can, we can see the photo of the house, the photo of the, for example, the kitchen, the toilet, and also the photo of the uh, social identity card of, of the family there. And also including the, uh, the information about what kind of the social protesting program currently the household uh, receiving now. So this kind of the system can be, uh, okay, uh, I've run out of time. Uh, uh, so this kind of the system can be used uh, for uh, across uh, ministry in order for planning, for example, this is, the system is already used by, uh, by the national uh, development planning and also by the uh, Ministry of the uh, Finance. 
uh, in order to plan and to in order to uh, arrange the budget for the social protection program. Okay, um, skip this one. So uh, this is the lesson learned that we have got. The first one, we have to prepare regulation for the management of the data. And the second one is that we have to build an integrated social welfare information system because we need the system to manage the big database there. And then number three, that we have to communicate the regulation and system and provide uh, technical guidance on the system utilization. I think that's all that I can uh, share to you today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Syed Misra, for your useful presentations, particularly focusing on the unified database for the social protection. Now time has come to hear from the participants. So uh, we would be happy to respond if you may have any concerns and queries and you may introduce yourself. You will be very brief, directly focus on your concern and also you, you would have a choices that you can ask to anyone of the presenters. So please, give him a mic. Uh, namaste, I am Bimal. Uh, I'm very much impressed with, uh, with last presentation that um, provides the very good uh, example of uh, database. But I'm quite uh, concerned with the accessibility of that for diverse user like me. Uh, is it really accessible or complying with uh, different uh, accessibility standards so that it can uh, support to different uh, users? So then we may collect a couple of more concerns if you may have and then My question is also to Dr. Said, like, you know, out of curiosity, um, how about the people who are landless, who do stay in rents? Like in Nepal, for any of the, like, you know, facilities or benefits and all, we need to have citizenship. I don't know, like, what is the situation there in Indonesia, but if you do not have that sort of document, how do you ensure those poor households or people, individuals in this whole database system? So then back, one more from the back side, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, Dr. Said, uh, I uh, thank you for a nice presentation. It shows how important the database is uh, to uh, the social security and other, other uh, uh, importance. One, I was uh, wondering uh, whether, uh, how, what were the challenges in maintaining uh, so huge uh, database uh, and how uh, you did overcome over the period. And uh, secondly, is this database used in disaster response, uh, relief and recovery? And if that is uh, how that has been useful, uh, because we are also discussing on SOC responsive uh, social protection systems arrangement. So how this database has been particularly uh, helpful uh, to respond to disaster uh, and SOCs. And secondly, I had a question to Yadu, sir, from Nepal. So is there any policy level distinction in between social security sector and the other development sectors? Because there are so many numerous uh, windows uh, to get into the social systems. And some look like uh, there is very thin thread in between. So is there any clear distinction? that uh, policy has identified. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. And then one more, please. Uh, my question is for Dr. Gasman. It's on um, cash plus and linkages, right? We talk about addressing non-financial barriers, and I know you highlighted that these barriers are very contextual. How do you go about identifying what pluses, what linkages might work, and how do you, because there's so many options. Even when you look at BCC, 50 different ways of delivering. Uh, is there any successful example that you can maybe talk to us about or how governments have done it? So thank you. We will respond uh, these queries first. And then uh, actually, the Dr. Said Mirza, that you have uh, three queries. 
to be responded. So please, uh, you start uh, from the, as you may hear that, uh, the accessibility in the, in the in, in unified database, how can you assure the better access to the database which you have developed and also the which document that you legitimize during you provide the access and you, you recognize the subscribers in the system and also the challenges if you may have faced the particular challenges that might be similar in our contest to maintain those databases. So please respond as quickly as possible. Okay. Thank you for the question. So, yeah, quite technical question, I think. So, uh, for data collection application, we, as I said, that we use the Android application. This Android application actually doesn't actually need uh, internet connection because they can collect the data. First, first they connect to the to the server, uh, download the data, and after that they can collect the data. Uh, Offline, yeah, cannot uh, without the internet connection. So we design uh, such kind of the application because, as you can see, that uh, the diversity of the uh, condition of the village in Indonesia, there is a remote area that cannot access the internet, right? So, uh, as uh, our experience, that there is no need uh, internet connection. Yeah, I mean the full internet connection only for the get to data and for transferring the data only. Uh, currently, for accessing the data, uh, we require the user to log into our system. Sure, they have to log into our system, and there is several role there. Not all the data can be seen by the register user, right? Uh, some of them only can see the aggregation of the data, and some of them can see uh, until the micro data, means that the address and also uh, the condition of the household uh, in the database. Uh, I still not got it about the second question. So actually, which document that you recognize during you provide the access uh, you, you, to the subscriber in the system, that document, what document you basically rely? Ah, the document? The document yeah, maybe citizenship or maybe national ID and whatever documents that you have. Or yeah. documentation for the system, you mean? Yeah, which document that you recognize? Which document type? Yeah, maybe the type means the, maybe not, not about the database, just the document, the legal document. The legal document? Yeah, yeah individual legal document, which you recognize? Yeah. Uh, as I said, that we currently connected to the, uh, I mean to the... Yeah, how you recognize uh, as a household? The household? So yeah. We, we the, our system has already interlinked with the civil registration, so, so we then, collect. Then the you already have the database of yeah. the households, yeah. Yeah, we already you have work on that. Yeah, please. Maybe the we, yeah, yeah we have it. already uh, had the household data. Yeah, it is based on the uh, population census in 2010 in Indonesia, and then we update it. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Yeah. So then I c would like to come. Up to the uh, Mr. Edu, that the query was how you do you have any policy distinction so that you can distinct the, the programs as a, as, a, as a social protection and also the other other sector related to the other sector, right? the functional distinction. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have. Uh, no distinct type of policy uh, to address uh, the social security schemes uh, in these days. Uh, only the periodic plans in its thematic sector address the policies. And the, for the distinction, uh, only the components incorporated in the policy uh, shows the difference uh, than the other policies of social security, just like in the social protection policy, we should incorporate the beneficiaries and their uh, characteristics as well as uh, the uh, modality of uh, transfer, uh, so transfer and uh, addressing the other uh, variables or other characteristics of the uh, beneficiaries. Uh, no very much distinct among other policies. Uh, so, uh, the 
Social security policy uh, to address the all social protection schemes is the, the leading policy is documented in uh, sectoral plans in, in our exercise uh, till now days. And the Ministry of uh, Labor, Employment and Social Security uh, is going to prepare a strategy paper for the social protection uh, in these days. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, finally, that uh, I would like to move on to Dr. Pensishka, that uh, the non-financial barriers about uh, the query about that, uh, please. Thank you for the question, uh, Preksha. How to identify what plus is actually necessary? I can, it's one word is analysis, and it is um, what if we see, for example, that the cash transfer program or other social protection measure doesn't really lead to the effects we have been expecting, yes? So why don't we see that people come forward and take it up? That could be an indication that there are design issues, which makes it unattractive or costly for people to apply or then take up whatever benefits and services they are, or we don't really see effects in terms of outcome. And uh, I just have been thinking of, uh, about possible examples. For example, in Kenya, there is a youth employment project, yes? Kind of where adolescents in certain uh, regions, they are provided with training. And so we did some qualitative studies and they were very happy about the training and that they had this opportunity. But then what? You know, so let's say if you learn a trade, for example, and you would like to execute it afterwards, you need some money. Maybe you need to buy a sewing machine so that you can start a, a tailor business. But you need money to get that sewing machine. So there, it, it, and so that maybe the, the, the plus is also to have to offer them some loans, microcredit, microloan project, or something like that. Very similar to what I know from Mongolia, for example, they also have these kind of trainings where people are very positive about. And again, after the training, then what? How can we utilize the knowledge that we have now learned and maybe become an entrepreneur and start something on their own? Or in the same way, so similar is if you have cash transfer, particularly for infants, pregnant mothers with young children, and you don't really see an effect in what we would see, child nutrition, child health, and things like that, then the question is also why? Maybe it is because there is lack of awareness about what is appropriate child feeding, how a baby should be fed once it is coming off the breast, for example, or how you, and that can be solved with relatively easy measures and maybe sometimes it's also that you have to top up the cash, yes, yeah? so to allow for transport. So there are different issues or you go broader in Uganda, for example, so you would actually argue, please make sure that your mobile network covers the whole country. Yes, also remote areas that people can utilize the mobile service and which will allow them also to participate in the economy. Uh, thank you very much, uh, all the presenters, for your response. So now we have come to the end of this session. So I would briefly uh, conclude that this session, uh, like uh, we have had uh, four presenters. And uh, from the National Planning Commission, uh, Mr. Edu was uh, presenting on the government of Nepal's initiatives for the policy harmonizations and integrations of the different systems from the perspective of sustainable financing and also the sustainability of the and also the effectiveness of the different schemes and he highlighted that Nepal has initiated about 80 schemes perhaps the one uh, of the countries uh, having uh, such a big number of schemes in, in South Asia and uh, he also highlighted on the importance of the engagement of the different sectors and particularly the different level of governments. And also he touched upon the government's growing, uh, increasing uh, obligations, the budget commitments to the, to the 
social security, social protection uh, scheme. So it was it was the first presentation, and next one by the Dr. Francisca. So she was basically focusing on the context, country context for the effectiveness, for the better results of this investment on social protection. And uh, the political will, of course, uh, she was highlighting and uh, how can we make the politicians uh, uh, have a same level of understanding, uh, largely the, their, their, their larger ownership uh, to contextualize it. And also the, the barriers like as, 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 uh, the, there was a queries as well, the non-financial barriers, uh, which uh, always seems uh, based on the country, different country context. And uh, she was highlighting the, like uh, con uh, the cash transfer, uh, how can cash transfer can be uh, translated into household income and also to the, to, to the, to the productive investment. So that cycle was quite uh, very good to see. And we also got uh, some sort of insights that if we could resign very good framework, uh, very good target on the, on the schemes and focus to the, to, the, to the beneficiaries and make a resilient system and then uh, the, 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 the opportunity remains to make those cash transfers as, as, as a product investment. So the Dr. Chaudhary was basically focusing on the, the financing perspective. So I was also very much eager to hear his, his opinions because we from the Ministry of Finance also are very much uh, remain under the pressure of managing such resources to finance the social protection schemes. Uh, he also came up with the, with the same spirit what we were experiencing. It's very hard to finance. You don't have big room uh, for, the, for the additional taxation and the globalizations, of course, the WTO arrangement and other international obligations that has provided very limited space for the governments to raise the tax particularly to finance the social protection schemes. So this is what uh, uh, was highlighted. And uh, his, uh, his uh, suggestions uh, to come up with uh, innovative financing tools, uh, of course, we have to define it. Also, it has to be contextualized. Uh, some country context might not be rightly replicated to the other countries. So we also focus on the same way, maybe to prioritize the allocations. Uh, so that the, the, the investment in the, in the social protection is supposed to be the investment in human development and which will uh, deliver the results for a longer term. And as uh, mentioned, uh, we should create, uh, we should justify that uh, those, those investments are, are as good as financial investment. Uh, so uh, which will uh, ultimately deliver the results, uh, maybe in medium and longer term. So this is, this is what uh, he was mentioning and presenting. Finally, the Said Mistra was basically focusing on the uh, unified database. We were also thinking in the same way the fragmented schemes can be better harmonized, better uh, coordinated, integrated if you would have uh, some sort of systems integrated database and uh, the, all the social protection schemes, the agencies will work on the same database so we can avoid the duplication. We can better focus on the utilization of the resources, quality of the expenditures, and also the, the complementing the, uh, the uh, each and uh, uh, one proposal to another, one agency to another agency and uh, uh, rightly trust to the people who, who, who basically need uh, the support from the government as a, as a cash transfer and also the social insurance schemes and also social um, uh, assistance schemes also as well. So uh, it was also discussed and uh, he also highlighted some of the experiences in his country context, they could able to catch up at least 40% of the uh, population. It was a huge in number in compared to Nepalese uh, population. So about 98 million people were already, uh, I think, enrolled in the, in the system in that unified database. So very good to see. Maybe very robust system they might have applied. So some sort of experiences that we can gain from the Indo Indonesian uh, Indonesian's practice, good practice. So. Uh, there was uh, some sort of questions coming from the audiences. Also, it was rightly responded by, responded by the um, presenters. So, uh, thank you all for uh, your patience, participations, engagement in this uh, very important uh, uh, session. And also the system development as we conclude. Uh, uh, before I conclude, uh, system development is not an easy, easy job. It's easier to say, but it's very hard to demonstrate as we are expecting
to be integrated the policy harmonization system harmonizations and also the database harmonization so these are the very important steps that we have to look at and and and, and in in the same way more importantly to find the options the alternatives the room for financing for the longer terms for the sustainability of the uh, schemes and also for the effectiveness of the expenditures the investment that we make in in, the, in particularly to the social protect through the social protection schemes so thank you all for being here and the, particularly the presenters that you presented where well, you responded well thank you thank you all for being here thank you very much thank you so much to all the speakers for this wonderful session and thank you so much mr shri krishna nepal for chairing this session so enthusiastically i request you all to kindly take your seats and now it's time uh, for a coffee break uh, but after that we also have a extended break where we will have uh, two parallel sessions going on here you will have an opportunity to talk to expert international speakers uh, you'll uh, it's going to be an open forum where you can interact uh, for almost half an hour uh, so i request all of you to come back here at the auditorium by 4 pm so that we can start with the uh, open interaction with our experts from abroad and parallel session will be happening at uh, malashi hall yes uh, madhavi hall like i said before uh, interministerial dialogue will be happening that side so if you want to be a part of the interactive session i request you to register yourself and after the interactions being done at 4:30 we will be starting our Kathmandu social protection conference declaration session so i request you all to be exactly at 4:30 pm so thank you so much i'll see you all at 4:30 sharp thank you <laughs>